scripture reading tonight is from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. That is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye also be. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We continue our series on <clears throat> excuse me, difficult and misunderstood scriptures. Now we're going to look at John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 4 and ask the question, where is Jesus going in this text? You know, this text is often one that is used at funerals. It is used with the idea that Jesus went to heaven to prepare it for our arrival and that he will come again and he will take us back there. This thought, as with many of these scriptures that we've considered in this series, most oftentimes the misunderstanding we might have about a scripture is not necessarily an erroneous one from a biblical perspective. And that is the case with this. The thought is true. Jesus is in heaven. Uh, he is at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for each of us, according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our heavenly high priest. So the idea that Jesus is in heaven working for us is certainly a true idea, certainly one that can be supported within the scriptures. But this text in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, there may be a question as to whether that is what it is teaching, that that is what Jesus is saying uh, here when he says, you know, let not your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, he says, are, are many places or many rooms or many mansions, depending on your translation. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then he says, I go. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again that where I am, there you may be also. And so, you know, we, we, we ask that question about where is he going because that's really the, the crux of the discussion. So let's consider the text. It is the night before Jesus is crucified. They are in the upper room. And he's there with the disciples at this point. He's there with the eleven, because Judas has already uh, allowed Satan to enter into his heart, as John says, and he has gone out uh, into the darkness of the night to prepare to betray Jesus. So at this point, Jesus is talking to the eleven. Verse 1, where he says, do not let your heart be troubled. We have to ask the question, don't we? Why is their heart troubled? Why is Jesus admonishing them not to have, let, this, let their hearts be troubled? Well, the reason why their hearts is troubled is because Jesus keeps telling them that he's going to die. And he has been doing this for some time. First recorded instance where Jesus talks to the disciples about the reality of him dying. We think it's somewhere a year, maybe a little over a year before this point. And the disciples never seem to, in fact, not just seem to, the disciples just do not ever take it well when Jesus talks about it. I think we understand that, don't we? You ever had someone that you love a great deal wanting to talk to you about their possible death? You got to want to talk about that, right? Let's, let's talk about something. We don't need to talk about that. We don't want to talk about that. And, and I think that's exactly what we see going on with the disciples oftentimes. When we look back to Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23, and this is right after Peter's great confession when Jesus asks, who do, who do you say that I am? And, they, and Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
But Jesus says in verse 21 in that same discourse, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and and be raised up on the third day. And Peter, get this, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine the, the audacity to take Jesus aside and to begin to rebuke him? saying, God forbid it, Lord. By the way, God doesn't forbid it. In fact, God wanted it. He says, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And we know this statement well. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. This is all about you, Peter. You don't want me to die. But the reality is God the Father does. We know that in the garden, do we not? Not my will, but your will be done. And so Peter is becoming a stumbling block. He's someone that's trying to prevent Jesus from doing the very thing that he came to this earth to do because Peter doesn't want to deal with that reality. Matthew chapter 17 then, in verse 14, following the events surrounding the the transfiguration and the casting out of the demon of the man's son says, And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And he will be raised on the third day. And then it says, And they were deeply grieved. That's the disciples. They were deeply grieved. They never liked to hear this fact that Jesus kept telling them. Look at what Jesus said just before the text that we're studying. Back in the upper room, chapter 13, instead of chapter 14, in verses 31 through 38, Therefore when he had gone out, the he there being Judas, Judas has just left the room. Therefore when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify Him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek Me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are My disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter then said to him, Lord, Where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I go you cannot follow me, but you will follow me later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Now, Peter's not getting at least initially here that this is exactly what he's going to do later, but, but he wants to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you that the rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. So Peter, you're saying a lot, but you're not going to live up to your words at the end of it all. This is why, this is the text preceding this, and this is why the disciples' hearts are troubled. The reason is, in verse 31, Jesus says, Now the Son of Man is glorified. Glorified means Jesus' death. That's where Jesus was glorified. That He's going to, to die. And look at Peter's reaction. He will not accept that statement. He doesn't want to accept that statement. He doesn't want to deal with that idea. And this is why Jesus tells them in our next text, "Believe it. you believe in God? Peter, believe in me. In other words, what I'm telling you, you need to listen to it. And whether you like it, and whether, or whether it's something that you want to accept or not, you need to believe what I'm saying to you. And that's why it's so powerful when we go past the resurrection to the Sea of Galilee and Jesus there in John chapter 21. And finally on that third time that Jesus asked him, Do you love me, Peter? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. See, that was Peter's problem. He didn't believe Jesus. Now he's learned different. You know all things. You know I love you. He now does believe Jesus. In Jesus. He's telling Peter, believe what I'm telling you. And their hearts are troubled because of Jesus foretelling about his death. 
Jesus continues in our text in verse 2. He says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. The disciples should not be troubled. They should trust Jesus as they trust God. And now he tells them that there is plenty of dwelling places with the Father. You're not going to be, you're not going to be left out. You're going to have a place in the kingdom. That word translated house is also used for family. It is also a word used for household. In my father's household are many places. In my father's, we might say at father's family, there is plenty of room for everyone. The problem is that no one can get into that household or that family because of sin. That's the problem. Jesus then states how he's going to solve that problem. Verse 2, he says, For I go to prepare a place for you. Remember 13 and verse 33, he says, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Jesus said this to the Jews referring to his death in John chapter 7 and verses 32 to 39. He's already made this statement. And he makes it again, once again, talking about his death. Chapter 13 and verse 1, it, this, this entire discourse, this entire night that he's talking to his disciples begins with these words. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. It says he departed, he was going to depart from this world. He was going to go to the Father. He's going to paradise, as he told the thief, right? And as he came to those very last moments of his life, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 tells us that when we die, the body returns to the dust and the soul returns to God who gave it. So, Jesus was going to die, but why? He was going to prepare a place. Prepare a place for us, for them, what place did Jesus' death provide? Well, it provided the kingdom. It provided the church. It provided the family of God to us. It gave us access to the household of God, which we had no access to before. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says that Christ purchased the church with His blood that He shed there upon that cross. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 through 22 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are God's household. There it is again. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the corner, chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. In my Father's house are many dwellings. His household, His family. And we're being built into that. Same terminology that we see in chapter 14. Jesus' death makes all that possible. His death made the preparation for us to have our sins forgiven and to be redeemed to God and to be brought into His household. So that's what the prodigal's about, isn't it? The prodigal son. It's about the ability to go home. To go to the Father. To have access to the Father. That's where we're heading in verse 6, isn't it? It's all about getting to the Father. And How are we going to get there? And that's what Jesus is making preparations for. Verse 3 says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know, if Jesus was to go and die to enable us to get into the Father's house, He would have to rise again. He's going to have to come again. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17 says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. The completion of all of this is in the resurrection. To just die on the cross wasn't enough. To, he had to die on the cross and rise from the dead, according to Paul. He has to come again. And it is only in that coming again that I might be where he's at. And so that brings us to the question of where is he? Well, Jesus is in a perfect, sinless relationship with the Father. That's where he's at. And I can never be there because of the sins that I have in my life until they're gone. Until his blood clothes my life and makes me as him. Verse 4 says, And you know the way where I am going. Now, Jesus told them over and over and over that he was going to die. Nine times, if you go forward in the text. Nine times from chapter 4 and verse 12 to the end of chapter 16 before he begins the prayer in 17. Nine times Jesus is going to talk about going to die. He talked about it in 13. He talked about it in, later in 14. He talks about it in 15. He talks about it in 16. Why in the world is that not what he's talking about here? Why do we suddenly make it into something completely different? When his other goings are the, to the cross. Why would their hearts be troubled that he'd be in heaven taking care of them? Their hearts are troubled because he's talking about what they don't want to hear. Time does not permit us to list and discuss all those instances of Jesus telling the disciples this fact. They know it. They just simply refuse to believe it. And that's why he says, believe in me. If you believe in the Father, you believe in me too. Believe what I am telling you. And then there in chapter 14, beginning with verse 5, Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And here it is, right? I am the way the truth, and the life. And what's the whole purpose behind all this? No man comes to the Father except by me. And how do they do that? Because He died. Because He went. He prepared a way for you and I to get there. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life because He lived, He taught, He died, and He rose. And because of that, He has prepared the means for us to be in the Father's household where there is room for all. He is the only one to do that. And therefore, He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life that gets a person to God. Gets a person to where He's at with God. Today, you know the way. Do you believe what Jesus has said. That, that statement is still important to us. You believe in God, believe also in me. Listen to what I'm telling you. And do what I say. If you do, he says, let not your heart be troubled by the sin that has hurt you and destroyed your relationship with God. I've gone and I've prepared a way to repair that, to fix that, to bring you back home, right? Because it's my sins and my iniquities, whether we're looking at Isaiah chapter 56 or we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, it doesn't really matter, saying the same thing. My sins and iniquities separate me from God. Jesus brings me back. And he is the only way to bridge that gap. And there is room for you tonight in the household of God. Jesus went to the cross to prepare a way for the truth, to enable us to be perfect and sinless and to have life eternal with the Father in heaven. He has prepared it. The only question left to us, and it's the question always left to us, Jesus done, has done everything that He can do, and all that's left on the table is what I'm going to do. He's prepared it for you. Are you going to take advantage of it? Or are you going to let it go to waste? Or are you going to let it be in vain for your life? It'll never be in vain because Jesus did it. But you can make it in vain for you by neglecting it. Don't do that. This evening, if you are not in a right relationship with God, if you are separated from the Father because of your sins, come back to Him. Jesus died to make that possible. 
Don't waste that in your life. We can help you. Why don't you let us as we stand and as we sing.